welcome all of you this afternoon to uh, an exciting panel. We're delighted to see all of you. And more than that, we're really excited to welcome our colleagues from Massachusetts. When we uh, titled this session, Massachusetts Comes to Michigan, we weren't really thinking that they might have the worst storm of the century. <laughs> We may they kept saying, February in Michigan, could we go to Florida? <laughs> we are thrilled that they're here. Uh, it's obviously a very important time in our state's dialogue on health care reform for them to be here. So we know that uh, you will appreciate uh, their, their comments, their perspective, the opportunity to hear a little bit about what happened in Massachusetts so we can be prepared uh, in Michigan. And, and just a couple of words about the importance of the timing of this event. Uh, for, for those of you uh, who were not aware, last <coughs> week uh, in, the, uh, in his budget announcement, Governor Snyder uh, made a recommendation to expand the Medicaid program in the state of Michigan. But in that, uh, but in the, uh, in that announcement, uh, we've heard from some in the legislature who have some questions, who aren't totally comfortable with that recommendation. And in earlier discussions that I had with the governor's staff, because he was really looking for a lot of facts, and, and uh, you can go to our website, and I think we gave you some information about issue briefs that we put out about the impact of Medicaid expansion on the state of Michigan. He really made a plea for the business community to get engaged. And so this could not be more timely, uh, because it really is going to be important for the business voice to be heard uh, as we talk about health care reform. Uh, Michigan, even with the governor's support of a health insurance exchange at the state level, was not, has not yet been successful at getting that through the legislature. So that, there's still lots of dialogue to be had uh, in our state about health care reform and about uh, the views of the business community. So this is a, a very timely and important uh, session to have in that context. I want to do a few thank yous, and then I'm going to turn it over uh, to Tom Buckmuller, who's going to moderate here, because I want to really get straight into the session. Uh, I want to thank Barry Rabe at Close Up here for co-sponsoring with us, and all of our co-sponsors at the Ross Business School, at the uh, Griffith Leadership Center, at the School of Public Health, at the Institute for Health Policy and Innovation, uh, and uh, we are just, and the Ford School, of course, we're just delighted to have all of you uh, as co-sponsors and appreciate all of your support. I want to specifically thank uh, Community Catalyst and Rob Restusha, uh, not only for making the trip out here, but really for putting this together. It's been fabulous to work with you and your team uh, on, this, on, on this journey. Uh, and I want to thank David Adler at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation for financing and supporting the Massachusetts team here uh, to share their story in many different locations. We think it's really going to be important and helpful. So thank you all for coming this afternoon. It's going to be an exciting opportunity for dialogue, and it's going to be very much about dialogue. And I, I am going to turn it over to Tom uh, from the Ross Business School here, who is going to kick it off and moderate the session. And I want to thank uh, Marianne for um, not only pulling this session <coughs> together, but uh, really making Chart a force for um, helping the university uh, contribute to the health policy discussion. Um, it's, it's really been great working with her. Um, because of the similarities between the Massachusetts health care reform and the, uh, the Affordable Care Act, there's obviously been a huge amount of interest in the Massachusetts experience um, among health policy researchers and analysts. Um, so there's been a lot of interest in understanding how the individual mandate works, uh, learning about the connector, um, learning about the way they expanded the Medicaid program. I think there's been less attention on the role that the business community plays. Um, and that's a really significant oversight when you think about the fact that in the US, nationally, uh, over 90% of people with private health insurance receive their insurance through the workplace. So employers for a long time um, have played a really central role uh, in financing health care, um, and I think they're going to continue to. So um, it's really important that we understand how in Massachusetts uh, employers influence the development and implementation of the, the legislation, um, and then to date, what has been the effect on the business community. So we're really happy to have with us um, from Massachusetts Rick Lord and Mike Widmer. Uh, Rick is the president and CEO of the Associated Industries of Massachusetts. And Mike is the president of the Massachusetts Taxpayers Foundation. And 
Um, as I said, I'm looking forward to hearing from them about their experience uh, in the development of this legislation um, and, and how they collaborate with other stakeholders um, and their take on, on where things stand today. And then uh, representing the home team, we have uh, <laughs> from, from the Ford School and ISR, um, Helen Levy, uh, health economist, and um, Rob Fowler, who's president and CEO of the Small Business Advantage of Michigan. Um, and so in addition to providing a Michigan perspective um, that each has their own point of view, um, Helen can tell us about uh, the economics of the Affordable Care Act and the poor sponsor insurance, um, and Rob can provide the small business perspective. So as Marianne said, uh, we'd like this to be very interactive. Uh, we'd like to have lots of questions uh, from the audience. I'm going to start it out with some questions, um, and then after a few minutes, we'll open it up and there'll be microphones uh, that will go around. So Mike, um, I thought I'd start with you, and maybe you can provide us some background uh, about the reform and, and tell us why the business community got involved the way that it did. Great. Thank you, Tom. It's a real pleasure to be here today. Uh, terrific turnout, and uh, so thank you very much for in inviting uh, Rick and me. Um, in the mid-2000s, it was around 2005, there was a major effort that was begun around health reform driven by John McDonough, who was at that point head of the consumer advocacy group uh, Health Care for All. He then uh, went down and worked for Senator Kennedy in Washington. It was part of the discussions uh, that led to the ACA. As the issue was ripening uh, in Massachusetts. Really, four group, four business groups came together um, to participate in the uh, in the discussions and and uh, the legislative consideration of the issue that had been put on the table initially by then Governor Romney. Uh, and the four groups were AIM, Rick, myself, the Taxpayers Foundation. Uh, the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce, and then the Massachusetts Business Roundtable. And we began to engage together uh, around this issue. I think there were two things that were driving our participation broadly. One is, I think we all agreed as individuals in our organization that it would be good if we could achieve universal health care in Massachusetts that that was a positive thing in a human sense and also I think we felt from a broad competitive point of view we already had a high level of employer coverage if we could have universal coverage that would actually be a plus overall for the state and the state's uh, economy at the same time I don't want to suggest that we are just pure um, there were there was a lot of uh, self-interest uh, for example, there was a proposal in the House for a new large payroll tax on employers. And we thought that was a bad idea, all of us, and so we fought very hard against that particular provision. But at the same time, we stayed at the table, uh, broadly defined. It wasn't as if we were all, I mean, the four groups were, but not all the other groups meeting. But we stayed at the table through the very long months uh, of uh, the negotiations and stalemates. And ultimately, we played a central part in brokering the deal around the employer piece of the mass uh, health reform. Uh, and so I think we feel very good about the fact that the final piece of legislation, everybody compromised, but um, it's a good piece of very good piece of legislation. I've been in around Massachusetts government and politics for 35 years, and I would put this up in the top one, two, or three pieces of legislation in any area that has been passed in, the la in that period of time. And then the key is it's been implemented well. Um, we all know experience of legislation that was sound on paper and then implemented poorly. Uh, this uh, the piece of legislation itself um, had, I think, the right incentives in place, and then the implementation has been done, done very well. I think the key couple of points, uh, one is that the key to the success of all of this 
has been that the stakeholders have continued to work together mm -hmm. even when we have disagreed. So in the legislative process, there were major disagreements among the various constituencies and stakeholders. And then subsequently in the implementation as well. But we all made a commitment, uh, providers, insurers, consumers, business, to try to work through it, and we have successfully. And finally, one key point in terms of the, um, the success of mass health reform, it's so basic that I think it often gets lost. And that is the individual mandate, which was a new, I mean, it actually come out of the, uh, uh, the Heritage Foundation and others in the early 90s, but nobody had ever implemented it uh, on the scale that uh, Massachusetts did. The intersection of the individual mandate and the high level of employer coverage uh, was the key, has been the key to success. So that many of the previously uninsured individuals um, who turned down an employer offer with the individual mandate then accepted the employer offer. So greater responsibility assumed by employers, but not in any, but in a market sense, not in any government uh, requirement of an employer mandate, rather the individual mandate intersecting with a high level of employer coverage. The Urban Institute did a study before, it said this is the most efficient way to do it, and that's what happened, and that's been the key success to the reform. So we have a shared responsibility of government, employers, and individuals. Thanks. Um, Rick, I wonder if you could tell us, uh, I'm sure the U.S. get lots of calls from people around the country um, asking about the Masters of Story. And in particular, what do you tell those business leaders that are maybe skeptical uh, about the reforms? Well, at first I tell them that we're really not crazy in Massachusetts when um, right after this passed, particularly in 2006 and 2007, Mike and I and others did get invited to speak to a lot of groups around the country and <laughs> they would look at us obviously very skeptically. Of course, this was all very new territory then um, and would say, why did you possibly agree to support the Massachusetts law? And I would say kind of what you, Tom, said at the beginning. Well, you know what, Massachusetts employers, all employers in the United States, you know, um, we provide the vast number of people who have private coverage with their health insurance. We're the biggest purchasers of health insurance um, for private sector employees. So why wouldn't we want to be at the table if we were going to talk about reforming our health care system, um, which other than payroll is for many businesses one of their biggest expenses. So. So we had kind of said, yeah, you know, for all the other reasons Mike cited, that you know, we needed to be at the table. And, and if you're at the table, you, know, you get to shape the outcome. Um, you know, the legislature and the, our governor really <coughs> wanted to understand our perspective in this whole debate. You know, they really wanted our support. Um, many of them had been around in 1988, went under Governor Mike Dukakis. We actually tried to pass our first universal health care law. We actually did. Um, and then we hit a bad economic stretch. Um, Mike Dukakis ran for president and lost, came back very unpopular. We elected Governor Bill Weld, the Republican who vowed to repeal the law and the business community never supported it to begin with and was instrumental in making sure that it got repealed. So for people with long memories, you know, they said, you know what, this time around, let's see if we can get the business community support. And so, they sought our support and you know, the opportunities to work with us and to get our input. So, so that's what I say, you know, why wouldn't you want to be at the table and help craft what it looks like? Um, and I would say equally importantly, and as Mike again alluded to, um, you know, we've seen many examples of laws that get passed and then implemented very poorly. Um, so we all stayed there working with all the state agencies and in the connector, which is our version of the exchange. Um, to make sure this was rolled out in a way that the business communities could support. So I actually saw a huge advantage for all of us to be there, both at its inception and then its implementation, and I think made a big difference. So, so maybe for both of you, if you I could follow up. And um, uh, looking back and maybe looking past the, the, the areas where there was agreement, there must have been cases where there was heated discussion and where there was disagreement and maybe being at the table wasn't so comfortable. Are there any examples you want to talk about that would 
give us a sense of, of how you work through that? Sure. Uh, the issue of the employer responsibility was part of the whole, obviously part of the whole debate. I alluded to the fact that um, we were opposed to an employer mandate. The House essentially had an employer mandate in their proposal and uh, with a large payroll tax. And even though all of the large employers, medium-sized employers, offered uh, health care, there was a strong sentiment that uh, requiring it as a mandate was not helpful to the state's competitive position. We're already a high-cost state and so forth. Um, so the House passed their bill. The Senate did not have an employer mandate. And for months, uh, they were at loggerheads. And basically, uh, the question was, well, are we going to be able to achieve reform? Behind the scenes, the four groups I mentioned and, and a couple of others were working to try to figure out, is there a way to uh, kind of thread the needle here? And so we came up um, with a, an alternative, what became the fair share assessment which is widely misunderstood, even in Massachusetts and certainly across the country. Um, the fair share assessment is essentially a $295 per employee per year assessment on employers who don't offer health care coverage or offer limited health care coverage. The point was their employees were still showing up at emergency rooms and getting free care. And so we said, all these things look easy in hindsight, but it took, I mean, it's one of those things, yeah, this, we worked through and said, wait a minute, it's not fair that their employees get a free ride, if you will. Other employers are paying part of that. The taxpayers are paying part of that. So we will have a, a, an assessment, $295 per year per employee, uh, on employers who don't offer health care. That was the average, so you don't go into each employer to decide you know, who's, who's taking advantage of free care or not. Um, that was the design that broke the log jam. So, but I can't describe the intensity of what happened before all of that. We had meetings upon meetings with the House Speaker with whom we had good relations, all of us. But he was out front on the payroll tax, and we weren't. And so there were lots of negotiations, lots of uh, collisions, and so forth. Obviously, the consumer groups had a different point of view. So that, I think, is the principal, uh, or one of the principal examples of where we played a very constructive role in the legislative pro uh, process in breaking the log jam, but in a way that we felt was important for the competitive position of Massachusetts uh, going forward. Rick, do you have any other? So that was a very contentious and um, fun debate to be part of. But I also think it showed, particularly the speaker, he did really want the business community to support this law at the end of the day. Yes. So the reason we had 25 meetings with him over the course of three months is he wanted to see if we could reach some consensus that we could support, right. which I give him a lot of credit for. Um, so one other incident that I was involved in, um, the, our connector authority, which again is our state exchange, was given the responsibility to determine what minimum creditable coverage is. So if you think about it under the ACA, what the essential health package is, um, was given to the connector authority to, to determine. So our connector authority was governed by a 10-person board. Um, there's one business seat. So Governor Romney, who was governor at the time, appointed me to that seat. And then Governor Patrick reappointed me. So I was actually served in that role for four and a half years with a variety of other people. So on that board were a variety of interests. There was a consumer representative, um, a healthcare economist, a benefits specialist, um, several people from state government. So diverse group of opinions, a union person. Um, because we were a public body, everything, every time we met had to be in public. So we'd be in rooms like this, and the 10 of us would be sitting here, and hundreds of people would be watching, including reporters and the media. And, um, so was, imagine debating something contentious like that. You know, what is that benefits package going to look like when the advocates were over here and the business people were over here and they didn't agree at all. And um, so we had a lot of 
um, contentious meetings, but I felt like the 10 of us kind of bonded through this experience because we felt like, geez, the eyes of the world are on us, um, or at least the eyes of the 200 people that were groupies and following <laughs> everything we did. Um, and we really wanted to make this work. Um, and so we somehow found a way to compromise. And you know, I didn't necessarily want to mandate that prescription drugs were included in um, the minimum uh, benefits, not because I didn't think they were part of good health care, but you know, 150,000 people in Massachusetts didn't have them, so that was going to automatically increase their premiums by 10 to 15 percent. The health care advocates didn't like high deductible plans because they thought they put too much cost on consumers, but you know, we had a lot of members that were offering those types of plans, so you know, debating all this publicly was a challenge, and yet at the end, we all kind of compromised um, and, and did agree 10 to 0 what the minimum credible coverage package needed to look like, which got even the attention of the Wall Street Journal, which wrote a front page story and said how 10 people are changing the landscape in Massachusetts. So it was pretty cool. Um, and I think, and I still, you know, I don't serve on that board of the connector now, but I do have to say the people that served there um, were willing to compromise not, you know, their core beliefs, but enough to say, you know what, we got to meet in the middle and make this happen. and. We're going to do it, and it was a pretty neat experience. Um, I think one of the challenges in trying to draw lessons from one state and apply them to another is, mm -hmm. is disentangling those things that are really specific to that state and mm -hmm. those things that are more general. Um, and Helen, I know that you've um, done research on employer sponsor insurance and then worked in Washington on implementation of the ACA. I wonder if you could say a little bit about um, how you see the Affordable Care Act uh, affecting the, the business case for employer-sponsored insurance? Yeah, uh, thanks, Tom. That's a good question. And actually, I want to pick up on something that Mike mentioned about um, the fact that most medium and large employers are already offering insurance. And you know, if you think about it, why are we talking about the role that businesses play? Because it's not obvious why businesses are in the game of insurance in the first place. But the reason they are is that uh, two reasons. One is um, employer-sponsored health insurance. And I think most people probably know this. Employer-sponsored health insurance uh, isn't taxed as income to the employee. So if I go out and buy health insurance as an individual, I have to do that using after-tax income. But if I get, as I do, insurance from the University of Michigan, I don't pay taxes on that approximately $12,000. So that's a big advantage for me as a taxpayer, getting my insurance through my employer. And of course, the other piece of it, um, and this is where things start to look different for large versus small employers, is that large employers have a big advantage in having a big pool of relatively healthy people that they can offer insurance to and avoid an adverse selection problem. That is to say, avoid getting all the sick people. Whereas for smaller employers, there's a different dynamic. So one of the things that's interesting to me as we think about the Affordable Care Act and how it affects um, employers is to think about the incentives of different employers and what are the concerns that they are bringing to the table with them given the different comparative advantage they have in the insurance market and given the different provisions of the law. Um, so for large employers, and the definition of large in the Affordable Care Act is 50 employees. <laughs> it's actually smaller in Massachusetts. You guys, I think, call a large employer 10 for the purposes for of the purpose of the assessment, yeah. but for the insurance reforms, it's 50 and fewer. OK, but yeah. the assessment is, is Assessment's 10. 11, 11 or more, yeah. OK. So, so mm -hmm. the Affordable Care Act, it's 50 or more. And by the time you get to businesses with between 50 and 99 employees, 95% of them are already offering health insurance. So that group, I think, faces one set of issues with the Affordable Care Act, and then small employers um, who currently have difficulty, you know, you can't offer the same <coughs> set of benefits. Anybody who's ever considered taking a job at a small firm, let alone try to run a small firm, um, knows that you can't get the same set of benefits with a small employer group that you can with a large employer group. So when I think from a theoretical perspective about the different the issues that businesses are bringing to the Affordable Care Act, it's really two sets of issues, different issues for small employers and large employers. So let me, uh, in a minute, I want to take, uh, open up for questions. So, so we have some mics that are going to go around. If, if you um, have a question, just raise your hand. But while uh, we're getting that set up, I want to follow up um, 
on this distinction between small and large employers, and, and Rob sort of ask you uh, from the perspective of small employers. Actually, I, I have a two-part question for you. Um, first of all, what do you think small employers in Michigan are most concerned about looking ahead? Um, and secondly, maybe to put you on the spot a little bit, um, you were at a press conference last week where you came out supporting the Medicaid expansion. Um, I wonder if you could sort of talk specifically about how you see that issue uh, affecting the business in Michigan. Well, first, uh, thank you, Tom, and thanks for the uh, opportunity to be here. Uh, being called the home team here at the University of Michigan makes me a little uncomfortable. I have to, <laughs> so, put that out there. Um, I'm delighted to be here with my, uh, my uh, compatriots from, uh, from Massachusetts. We've been uh, admiring and uh, studying what you, what you did in Massachusetts for some time. Um, I see some of my uh, friends in the room who I sit around a table uh, worrying about the issues of the uninsured for a number of years. Uh, and so we've been, we've been admirers at times, and we've scratched our heads at times to try to figure out what you, what you were thinking in Massachusetts. <laughs> <laughs> that said, so, you know, I, I think the issue for small business, and this was true before all this, this started, and frankly, I've been advocating for small business for almost 30 years, and sadly, it's the same issue that it was 30 years ago, and it's cost. Sure. That is the issue for small business. It is, it's a... Um, I remember when this used to be called a fringe benefit, and there's not much fringy about it today. Uh, you know, it's, it's a major cost of doing business, and, and you know, to, sort of to the, to the question uh, Helen answered a minute ago, why do employers provide health insurance? Well, I don't, it may be, uh, the, soft, the blow may be softened by tax treatment, but the, the reality is you do it in order to attract and retain employees to make your business competitive. That didn't change. That was true before, it's true after. What's changed is the cost of health insurance. It's become too big a burden for a lot of companies to, to bear. And I think they've had to make very, very difficult choices along the way about whether I can even compete not offering health insurance to, to my talent. So the issue for us is cost. Now let me try to connect that to Medicaid expansion. It's interesting, uh, it's, it's been mentioned already, but the reality is people get health care. If you, if you get hit by a bus and you go to the emergency room, you get health care. And if you can't afford it, you still get health care. Uh, if you come with no coverage at all, you get health care. That turns into uncompensated care in our health care system. So in a hospital, that's uncompensated care, and they pass it along to their paying customers. That's the, way it, that's the way it works. It finds its way into the base costs. If you want to know why aspirin costs seven bucks, this is one of those reasons. It's, it's cost shifted to the, to the paying customer and it's a, it's a terrible way to do business. Taking an increasing expense um, and shifting it to a decreasing group of payers who are struggling every day to continue to pay that cost. That is a terrible way to do business. And that's been going on for a very long time. It's one of the biggest drivers of healthcare costs today for small, small business, for all business, for all premium payers, is cost shifting. If those people who came to the healthcare system without payment had payment attached to them, and in the case of Medicaid expansion, that means a billion and a half to two billion dollars a year, in, in Michigan, if a billion and a half to two billion dollars worth of payment came along with the cost of care, we think that cannot do anything but have a, a beneficial impact on rates for the rest of the people who pay the, who pay the bills. Um, that's not altruistic, that's pure math. That's the, the reason we support it is because we believe it's good for our members and for those who, who continue to pay the cost of health care. Without that, and I, I would say, you know, generally speaking, we did not support um, the, the um, ACA. Uh, we saw that there were some good pieces and some bad pieces, but um, on the whole, we didn't support it. But one of the principles of the Affordable Care Act is everybody in. 
if everybody's in the system, if everybody's paying, if people can actually sit on the sidelines and wait until they're sick and then come in and bring their costs to the healthcare system and sort of shift those costs to those people who are in the system and paying, uh, that is a, an unsustainable model. So individual mandate, something we've supported for a long time, and, um, and Medicaid, at least, if we're going to have a Medicaid system for the people who are poor, then let it pay for those who are eligible for it. And then if everybody's in, the cost can come down for everyone. At least the upward pressure comes down on everyone. That's why we support a Medicaid expansion. Okay, well, why don't we open it up to uh, questions from the audience. If, if you like to ask a question of any of our panelists, just raise your hand and we'll bring the mics by. I'm wondering how you handle the question of uh, abortion and uh, birth control costs in the mm -hmm. package of Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. No, I don't even know. Um, <laughs> it, yeah, very carefully. Um, <laughs> yeah, I actually think the legislature had already mandated that prior to us taking up, you know, health care reform. So it was already in there and it didn't come up in any of our discussions um, as we were deciding what the essential benefits package was. So. Um, I do think there's a, there is a religious exemption of some sort, um, but it wasn't part of our, our discussions, which I'm happy about. Uh, yes, to um, the folks from Massachusetts, you're probably aware of the Wall Street Journal editorial um, oh, yeah. late last month about costs in Massachusetts. It sounds ghastly to me. Um, the reading from the uh, from the editorial, it said that healthcare was 23 percent of state costs in 2000, 25 percent in 2006, and it's now 41 percent for 2013. And then, of course, as you probably know from having read the um, editorial, um, Deval Patrick is, as of this moment, I guess proposing a billion dollars in tax increases in Massachusetts. What, what does that say about um, holding down costs with the Massachusetts type system? Well, the editorial would be ghastly if it were true. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me peel that question apart. Um, when we passed universal access, we understood that that was phase one uh, of dealing, reforming health care, and that we would need a phase two dealing with costs. Um, we had faced, like every state, just about every state, escalating health care costs for years and years and years uh, preceding our health reform and then uh, after health reform as well. So it wasn't, health reform was not the cause. Uh, so we have, we all came together, the stakeholders, uh, and passed a major cost containment bill last year, uh, I won't, which is quite comprehensive and was quite contentious. Uh, I won't get into the details at this point, um, but we can talk about it later or afterward. Um, the important point, though, is that we already in Massachusetts were bringing down the rate of growth of health care costs, not simply a matter of the recession, obviously that dampened utilization, but through our combined efforts of the providers, insurers, and business community and consumers uh, moving toward uh, global payments and reforming our entire system, we had seen our hospital costs, for example, which were growing 10% a year, go down into the low single digits. So we have been successful in controlling our health care costs, not to our full satisfaction, but at least a start. The other piece of the editorial, and the one that is, is the, the faulty, well, the whole editorial was, um, it ties to the uh, spending in the, in the uh, state budget. 
Our number one role in Massachusetts Taxpayers Foundation is as a fiscal analyst and watchdog over state and local finances. So we've put together a couple of reports, and this is the most recent one, April 2012, Massachusetts Health Reform Spending, an update on the budget buster myth. The issue of the cost of Medicaid growing and consuming more and more of limited state dollars is something that has bedeviled Massachusetts for 25 years and most of the other states in the nation as well. So the numbers that the editorial referred to, and this part was semi-accurate, in terms of the percent of the budget growing from the low 20s to the high 30s over about a 15-year period, relates to Medicaid, the Medicaid program. Health reform has added only a very small portion to that cost, and that's what the conclusion of this report says. It's on our website, MassTaxpayers.org. The governor's tax, the last point, the governor's tax package that he's proposing is not to pay for health reform and really has no connection whatsoever to health reform. It's to pay for principally investments in transportation and education. So that's the focus of his initiative. Uh, despite the fact that there is an overwhelming democratic legislature, his proposal, in my view, will be scaled back dramatically if it's passed by the legislature. But in any case, it has nothing to do with health reform. If I could just add to what Mike said, too. Uh, you know, as Rob said, you know, before we did our reform, health care costs were the number one concerns of the members of AIM. You know, they were growing at greater than the consumer price index and, you know, just continued to be a challenge for particularly small employers to pay for health insurance for their workers. Uh, you know, we did say when we passed our law, you know, we all said we'll be back to address costs because this was about access and in, in 2006 we couldn't reach agreement on doing the whole thing. So we agreed we'd be back. Um, we did pass this big cost containment law last year. We have set a target to reduce health care spending in Massachusetts to um, the growth of our state economy. Um, so this year we have a target to for our health care spending not to exceed 3.6 percent. If we're successful, that will, you know, be quite different than what we've experienced in recent years. So we are serious about costs, but as Mike said, you know, our health care costs, it was medical inflation and a whole lot of other reasons that were driving the cost even before the reform. Um, and the fact that health care is such a big percentage of our state budget is reflective of the growth in our Medicaid program, the downturn in the economy, and a lot more people signing up for the Medicaid program. You know, our budget actually has shrunk during those years, but the percentage dedicated to Medicaid and other safety net programs has grown. So for a lot of reasons, that percentage does, I mean, it's worrisome just to look at it, but it's uh, not attributable to our reform law per se. Um, if, if you could uh, identify yourself. Sure. Uh, I'm Chuck Haddon. I'm President and CEO of the Michigan Manufacturers Association. I'm drawn to um, some interesting conclusions. I'm sitting here listening to you, and I guess I want to ask a couple quick fire questions. You're uh, a good sized state, population wise, pretty equal to us, um, with a major city. Mm -hmm. uh, how competitive is your health care? Um, how many companies come in and, and what was it before? How competitive was it before, and how competitive it is, is it now? How competitive in terms of the uh, companies? The number of companies or insurance side? Or insurance, or yes, the, insurance companies. Also yeah. The hospital side. Yeah, no, I meant insurance side. Yeah, so um, yeah, it's competitive. You know, we're a little probably different. Well, maybe we're not that much different from Michigan. Um, we have pretty much five homegrown, not-for-profit insurers. Um, Blue Cross is the big one. Um, how, which much, how much market do they have? Yeah, a little less than half, I think. And then we have four other nonprofit insurers that are headquartered in Massachusetts that share the rest of the market. Um, the national insurers like Cigna and Aetna 
and others have only a small percentage of the market. But um, and that hasn't really changed at all since 2006. The um, so they're all they, they're all players to about the same extent they were. Uh, hi, I'm Locke McKay with Shepherd Advisors, and I'm, I'm impressed with the number of folks that participate in the Massachusetts program. And I'm, and I'm curious to whether, particularly for smaller employers, having that level of participa participation has really sort of leveled the playing field from a talent attraction perspective. In what ways do you see the Massachusetts program having really helped? smaller companies. Uh, the operating assumption is that it would really not help them so much. But, but what, have you, have you, what have you experienced? And um, as you're looking at the Affordable the uh, Care Act, um, do you, are you disappointed with the level of participation that's expected? I mean, just get, would love to hear your perspectives about that. You want to go ahead? Um, <clears throat> you know, the great thing I would say about Massachusetts having, having us do it ourselves is, um, is that we were all, we all knew each other, all the stakeholders um, had previous relationships. Um, we could work very closely with our legislature to kind of design it to fit Massachusetts and we're not the same as every state and you know we certainly would acknowledge that. So um, there was some benefit to, I think, actually a great deal of benefit for us to be able to have done our own thing and um, really designed it to, to fit us and to get all of our input. Um, you know, in terms of small employers, um, I would say a couple of things. Um, you know, we've actually seen an increase in the number of employers that offered health insurance. You know, there was a fear that, and not from us, but others that said, oh, there's a penalty of $295 if you don't offer health insurance. People are just going to drop it and say, I'm going to pay the 295 Well, that wasn't the case. We didn't expect it to be because, really, they don't offer it because of a penalty. They offer it, as Rob said, because you need to do it in order to attract the talent that you want. Um, so I kind of think there is more of a level playing field among small employers looking to attract a talented workforce. Um, you know, and this might come up later, you know, our exchange hasn't attracted a lot of small employers to purchase through the exchange. We have a lot of other avenues to purchase in Massachusetts, uh, including a private sector exchange, purchasing directly through the carriers, um, which continued to be active in Massachusetts. So um, it hasn't played a major role like it might in other states. Um, we'll see how that all plays out. But, um, you know, I think um, the small, business community would tell you that um, A, you know, health reform was a good thing, and two, let's tackle the costs as seriously as we did the access question in 2006. Hi, I'm Hi, Gib Sharon with Shar Music here in Ann Arbor. Uh, <laughs> this is a very interesting topic. Uh, I've had a lot of friends who are business owners who are terrified of the American, uh, like we were saying, the healthcare, Affordable Health Care Act. My question for the Massachusetts, uh, your experience was with the fair share, I found that very interesting because I think that's where you have tons of people who aren't paying into, the, into healthcare. And what I was curious about is what kind of revenue was generated just from that fair share? I, I would imagine it was significant. And then my second question as a follow-up was, was there anything in your, uh, in your program that uh, helped guide decision making? Because I've seen even in our own company, bad health decisions made over and over and over again that certainly have an effect on health care costs. Let me answer the first part and then Rick, I think we'll do the second. Um, the fair share contribution, as I mentioned earlier, is the per employee per year cost uh, for, uh, on, for employers who don't offer uh, care. So, whose employees um, don't offer insurance, whose employees show up at emergency room and so forth. Um, it's interesting on how much that is, has raised. Uh, the state initially thought it would raise something in the order of 50 to 100 million dollars uh, annually. I and others um, who looked at these numbers uh, were skeptical because uh, this applies to 
employees of 11 or more, and 90 plus percent, well into the 90s, percent of employers in Massachusetts, 11 or more offer health coverage, so it was just arithmetic. There aren't very many who are going to not, uh, who don't offer health coverage and therefore have to pay the penalty. So initially it didn't raise, it raised um, just about uh, 10 to 20 million dollars, much less than anticipated by, by some, though as I say, I, where I expected it would end up. So they kind of toughened it. Uh, they changed some of the rules because they wanted to raise some more money. This was two years into, uh, into it. <laughs> we argued, there were two or three of us argued, said no, you're still not, even with that, you, you're not going to raise much more money. Uh, it turned out we were right. And so the most recent year, it's raised only $14 million. So the 295 was a political compromise that basically uh, broke the log jam that allowed us to achieve universal health reform. But the employer piece is, is the intersection, the employer responsibility piece uh, is not really fair share because that's so narrow. It's the intersection of the individual mandate and the high level of employer coverage. And so it's all of the previously immortal uninsureds who now are taking up health care, uh, taking up employer offer. And that's where the employer responsibility has, has uh, been uh, focused. Uh, but it's fascinating because in the national news, the fair share has been seen either as an employer mandate from those on the right, and, which it isn't, and they've criticized it, or inadequate from those on the left, and it's neither. <laughs> it was a political compromise that, that basically achieved health reform, but misses the larger point about employer responsibility in our achievement of universal access. One answer, the other. To answer just your question about that on the cost side, uh, so as we said several times, our law was about access, but, um, and we really do believe solving the cost issue is going to be a multi-pronged approach. And one is to educate employers and help them educate their employees about how to become more engaged and better purchaser, purchasers. So we actually started a campaign last year to begin that. Um, and so we went around the state, we featured employers in different parts of the state who had done some interesting things. And I remember one it was a big retailer with a lot of low-income employees that got health insurance for the first time. And you know, they didn't have primary care doctors. They went to emergency rooms every time they needed health care. Um, they just you know, weren't good consumers and consumed in a very expensive way. And so the benefits manager of this company talked about the program she initiated to, because she said, we had to educate them about they had health insurance for the first time and they just needed some direction that that's not where you go um, when you have a cold or an you know, earache. Um, we featured other employers that had done creative things around designing benefits to encourage healthy behaviors and people with chronic diseases to take their medications, um, employers that did really meaningful wellness programs. Because we really do think that Again, it's going to be multi-pronged, but one thing that we can do is help employers become smarter and more engaged purchasers. And they would ask us, and help us talk to our employees, because we don't know how to do that either. Um, so we purchased it on their behalf, but we've never talked to them about how to become better consumers. So I do think there's a big role that employers and associations can play in that regard. Can I, can I just mention, I think uh, the, the advantage of watching another state go through this before you is to learn the lessons uh, that, that, are, that yeah. are there to learn. And uh, as we've talked about it, um, I, I think you saw cost as an issue unaddressed in the initial version of it. Mm -hmm. I think the lesson for Michigan is we have got to get serious about cost containment as the ACA comes in, into place. Um, I see Senator Marlowe is here, and Senator Marlowe has been pushing uh, the um, the Senate, at least, for um, a focus on cost containment. And I think uh, we ought to do what we can to support his efforts. Uh, if we don't get serious about cost containment as the uh, ACA comes into, uh, into place, and I, I actually think it's kind of a state issue. There may be some federal issues to, to take care of, but there's a, a robust state public policy agenda mm -hmm. around this. And again, I think we can learn from Massachusetts. Uh, but. Uh, 
if we're not hearing that message that we've got to get serious about cost containment, because you can talk about access and you can talk about who pays for it, mm -hmm. but if nobody can afford it, including the federal government, we've got a problem. And I think mm -hmm. that's really where we sit today. Yeah. Well, if I can follow up on this issue of cost containment, um, I know, Rick, you were on the connector board. Now you're part of this new uh, board that was set up from the 2012 legislation. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about, not the specifics of legislation, but your take on what it means to have business at that table and involved in the process going forward? So, yeah, so what Tom is talking about is the, our legislature passed last year a big cost containment bill. They created a health policy commission as part of that that will implement a lot of the cost containment provisions that was included in the law. That's governed by an 11 person board. Um, Again, the governor asked me to sit in there as the em employer seat. Um, but there's a lot of different stakeholders around that table as well. Um, and we just got up and running, so it's a little early to report any successes there. Um, but um, I think, well, as I always say, it's the number one concern of the members of our organization. We survey them every fall. We just did that in the fall of 2012. We asked them what their major concerns about doing business in Massachusetts. The cost of health insurance <clears throat> is way up here. And then the cost of taxes, regulatory burdens, um, energy, you know, everything else is kind of on a second tier. So it's still, you know, up at the top of the list. Um, it is hard, you know. We thought access was hard um, in 2006. This is really hard. Um, and it's. I really do think that there's a lot of things that need to be done. Um, there's no one answer. Um, you know, so we're seeing payment reform implemented in Massachusetts, so our insurers are moving away from fee-for-service to global payments um, um, because fee-for-service, as we know, rewards volume um, as opposed to quality care. Um, you know, we've, we've mandated that all of our insurers offer tiered or limited network products so that consumers begin to have choices and will pay more to go to higher cost, less quality providers. Um, and we've mandated that those products have at least a 14% differential in terms of the price. Um, and I guess the big thing this commission will focus on is we've set this target to reduce the rate of growth of spending. Um, and you know, we don't have, you know, if we fail to meet their target, um, you know, the consequences aren't necessarily spelled out, but the fact that we're going to shine a light on whether we're successful or not, um, we'll be holding hearings, um, you know, if we fail to achieve the target, we'll be looking at individual providers that may have caused us to not be successful. I mean, shining the spotlight on this um, on an annual basis um, is, I think, will change the dynamic and will you know, nobody wanted price controls and heavy regulation. We all agreed to that. Um, let's see if we can, the market can straighten itself out. And that's what we're going to be working on. Just might add a, one or two things. Um, I think we are, Massachusetts is uh, where we were in uh, access in 2006. Passed a law, had a lot of promise. The question was how, how would we implement it? So now we have this rather sweeping cost control law passed last year, and now the question is, how are we going to implement it? Are we going to do it well or not well? And there's enough room in there to, uh, uh, to, to cause a lot of trouble um, and uh, do it not well, I would argue. I, in the business community, during the process of leading up to this, while well, the legislation was being debated, we're arguing strenuously that we should, this legislation should build off of the market forces that were already beginning to slow down the rate of growth of health costs in Massachusetts through the new payment systems and other efforts. Um, some of the worst uh, elements of particularly the House bill did hit the cutting room floor, ones that would have been a huge overreach on the part of government and would have, in fact, compounded the problem and uh, uh, put the state government into a realm that it would be simply impossible to handle sensibly. As I say, blessedly, a lot of that um, did not make it, make it in the final legislation. But it still is uh, a comprehensive 
uh, piece of legislation. And I'm very grateful Rick is on the commission and, uh, and some others, but uh, because the jury is very much out as to whether we are going to be able to handle the implementation of, of this phase two as well as we handled phase one. Can I just say from our standpoint, uh, whether you do it well or not well, I don't really care. <laughs> we'll be watching. Okay. <laughs> Lessons learned. All right, whatever way. Yeah. Can I ask, uh, there's a question that came in from Twitter um, that had to do with uh, the connector. Um, the connector, like the ACA exchanges, is, is an online marketplace. Um, so it's a new way of, of buying insurance. And the question was, did you observe any hitches um, in moving people uh, into the, the online market? Um, I don't think so. You know, uh, I would say it's a much more robust place than it was in 2007 when we started to sell. I mean, again, we were kind of learning as we went along, um, and there had been a lot of improvements. But um, and as I said, a lot, not a lot of small employers purchase their health insurance through our connector, but a lot of individuals, the kind of non-group market, most of that whole marketplace did move to the connector and I think, you know, have had a very favorable buying experience. You know, they do uh, surveys of customer satisfaction and um, it's been pretty, um, uh, the results that I've seen are pretty favorable. So I think we've done it pretty well. May I just add a little story here? You might wonder why we call it the connector. Um, Gov then Governor Romney introduced it as an exchange. Um, and the heavily Democratic legislature, uh, uh, when they decided to go along with this concept, didn't want to give him credit, so it was renamed the Connector Authority. <laughs> <laughs> and so now we have to keep explaining that our connector is our exchange. Right. Uh, Jeff, so, anyway. <laughs> this is just hot off the Twitter wire. <laughs> we hear that doctors are going to leave practice due to health reform. Any data on healthcare workforce changes in Massachusetts? Not, uh, not yeah. that I know of. I mean, yeah, it's I not was, an issue that's surfaced. No, you know, the challenge we had was initially, all of a sudden all these people had health insurance, they wanted primary care doctors. Like every part of the country, there's not enough primary care doctors in Massachusetts, but it's not a Massachusetts problem. It's a nationwide problem and the fact that we don't really compensate them as well as we do other specialists. Uh, but there was initially, it was difficult for some people to find one because panels were closed and um, I'm not sure if we've solved that yet. But I can't say there's been an out-migration of physicians out of right. Massachusetts. Website for the Michigan survey. Oh, that's right. Um, uh, Matt Davis has, has a nice uh, piece that just came out. Uh, the chart website that's a, a survey of uh, physicians in Michigan asking about how they're going to respond to uh, the expansion of Medicaid. Um, and I think the answer was overwhelmingly that there is capacity in the state, um, if I'm characterizing that properly. Um, why don't we, there's a couple more back here, yeah, weren't you? Hi, uh, Joe Tassi, and uh, thanks for being here. Um, one of the things you haven't uh, spoken to is the uh, engagement of the provider community in the whole dynamic as you went through it. You did, so I'm glad, uh, Mr. Lord, you just talked at the beginning about finance reform in terms of trying to get at the incentives mm -hmm. uh, for the way care is delivered. But uh, did you or how, how do you intend to engage the provider community or is it just through finance reform? Because it seems to me that the, the real cost in health care is in dealing with chronic disease management, end of life. Yeah. You know, the uh, coordination across continuums of care, I mean, that's what we're hearing about nationally. And I'm not hearing that in your, in your, uh, in your dialogue as yet. So I would say that, you know, the providers certainly were very active in the whole cost containment debate that we had the last two years. Um, because you're right, I mean, that's where the cost drivers are. And, you know, we kind of are relying on them without mandating that they do certain things because you know, it wasn't like one size fits all. Um, but, you know, if we're going to meet our spending target, you know, it'll be because the providers did the things like the disease management and the case management and other creative things that you have mentioned. And we changed our provider payment system um, to reward um, 
good behavior. It'll be those things that allow us to achieve our goals. So um, I don't want to make it sound like they were engaged. They're very engaged in watching this very closely. Um, and um, and they're, if we're not going to be successful in reaching our target unless the providers figure this out. But we didn't want to mandate and regulate, set price controls and do all that stuff. You know, we're kind of taking them on their word that they're making a lot of progress, as Mike said, and we want them to continue. The, we have some of the great, obviously, hospital systems in the world, and they're really crown jewel of the Massachusetts economy, linking in with uh, the whole biopharmaceutical, life sciences, and so forth. Um, but they've been at the, the forefront. One of the reasons we've been able to begin to bring down our uh, growth in health care costs is these providers and the insurers and working together, struggling sometimes, and, but, uh, but nonetheless working together to be on the cutting edge of disease management and uh, technology and the use of technology to try to control uh, these costs, especially, for example, around these costly cases. Um, so we're, we're fortunate that they have driven a lot of what's already taken place. Michelle Seeger, I'm curious about uh, how Massachusetts considers the role of, of promoting healthy lifestyles to individuals as part of your strategy for cost containment. So our healthcare cost containment law creates a, creates a $60 million wellness trust fund that will be administered by our Department of Public Health um, to do a number of things, but to A, promote a healthy lifestyle campaign, just as we kind of did the whole anti-smoking campaign of the 90s that has turned out to be, you know, very successful. Um, um, so they've received a substantial amount of money to do that. Um, the law also created tax credits for small employers that implement wellness programs. Um, and we're just getting the rules out um, about how those will all work. But um, there will be you know, part of this, we do see as part of the solution, um, the whole promotion of healthy lifestyles, and whether it's through a statewide campaign by the Department of Public Health, whether it's by encouraging employers to implement meaningful wellness campaigns. We have some great examples of big employers in Massachusetts, you know, EMC and Raytheon are always mentioned as models of employers that have really done a lot of creative things to work with their employees and to educate them. The challenge has been small and medium-sized employers. You know, they don't have the tools. They don't have anybody in the company that has the expertise to lead them through this. Um, so we've got to figure out how to bring some of those successful models um, to small to medium-sized employers. But that is part of the vision. Yeah. And I would say I think that we've reached or are reaching a critical mass in Massachusetts uh, around employer um, initiatives on the whole healthy lifestyle um, uh, effort. And not only because it's the right thing to do, but obviously it also helps to improve the uh, health care of their, of their workforce. Can, can I just uh, maybe even ask a little bit of, of you guys? I mean, I think one of the issues for, uh, you know, this is a true distinction between large and small. If you're large, mm -hmm. self-insured, you yeah. invest in wellness and the, and the rewards come back to you sure. directly. Yeah. Uh, if you're small and you buy an insured product yeah. and your, in, your entire uh, employment, you know, if you've got 23 employees and none of them have a claim next year, yeah. your rates go up with the pool. Right. Um, it's a disconnect between, you know, a workplace-based wellness program and your rates. There's just no connection to it. Yeah. So Can that's... Correct that one? Uh, maybe, maybe we'll correct it and then share that experience with you. <laughs> um, no, that's a great point. For In Massachusetts, if you have 50 or fewer employees, you're in the small group pool. And you're right, you just rated with that whole big group. And even if you do everything right and you have the healthiest employees in the world, you won't benefit like larger employers do, mostly. I will say, though, that you know, we hear, and, I, and there's a lot of data to show this, you know, healthier employees you know, and are absent as much, they're yeah. more productive at work, they have fewer workers' comp claims. So, even though you might not see the direct payback in terms of your health insurance premiums, there are other paybacks for having a healthier workforce. And um, 
uh, we would like to connect it even more, as you suggest, Rob, but we haven't figured that one out yet. But we'll tell you when we do. Please. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, my name is Sharon and I'm a small business owner. I have a dozen employees and I'm actually really happy that there are some legislators in the room listening to this panel. That makes me really happy. Um, what I wanted to know from the Michigan folks is, um, are there panels being created um, that are starting to address these very issues? Um, and what, and maybe the Massachusetts guys need to answer this, what's the likelihood that we can make this happen and keep the, mis the misinformation from dropping reform entirely? Well, I think from, from my perspective, reform is on its way whether we, you know, I mean, the, the, the reality is they did it at the state public policy level. Now that it's happened in, in Washington, it's coming. We do have some choices to make in Michigan about how to do it. And I think one of those choices is the exchange. What does it look like? And, um, you know, the, the reality is the state legislature has not passed exchange legislation in Michigan. Uh, therefore, uh, hasn't allowed us to receive federal money to design it, like $9 million sitting on the sidelines, uh, uh, not able to, to bring down. The, the, almost the entire business community in Michigan has supported putting an exchange in. Doing it now, doing it Michigan's way, as opposed to allowing the federal government to come in and, and sort of impose one. Uh, plus, you still have to connect up Michigan's Department of Community Health and, and um, Medicaid system and eligibility, and there's a lot of working pieces to a, a viable exchange. Let me say to you, uh, from my perspective, the exchange will be far more beneficial in the individual marketplace than it will be in the small business marketplace. Mm -hmm. I think that's been your experience. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in Michigan, we actually have had a very different system than Massachusetts had going in. We have one large dominant carrier, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan, who has a different set of rules than everybody else. They community rate. No health underwriting, meaning if you're sick, you're going to get the same rate as if you're healthy at Blue Cross Blue Shield. Other carriers play by a different set of rules, and that has created yeah, this long-standing dialogue about um, cherry picking and, who, you know, and rating. All that goes away with ACA. That, that debate goes away. Everybody goes to community rating. I think one of the beneficial pieces of it um, so, I, I mean, there are some pieces that are going to happen that I think are going to be good for us, good for small businesses here in Michigan. Um, this cost containment thing is really the issue, I think, that if we've learned any lesson at all, we have to understand that the, the Affordable Care Act did nothing for cost containment, just as the initial version of, uh, of the connector and, and your reform law in mm -hmm. Massachusetts. Uh, Again, if we haven't paid attention and, and put that panel together in Michigan, um, let me give a, another word to what Senator Marlowe is trying to do. Great discussion going on right now. Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan changing from one form to another. And, uh, and uh, the sort of political deal that's being created is out of that will come a billion and a half dollars into a new trust fund, a new organization and fund. And the question is what will a billion and a half dollars do uh, in, in the future. Uh, my perspective, our perspective is, if we don't use that opportunity to talk about cost containment, about bringing down the cost for everybody, and we let it actually become a, a subsidy fund for seniors and children, I love seniors and I love children, but if that's where that goes, then I think we have made a huge mistake, a make, mistake of time. I think Senator Marlowe is really, I, th I think he agrees with that, and that's where, why he's been trying to uh, put into that legislation that it has a purpose that is cost containment. I wonder if I could um, put Helen on the spot, uh, because the Affordable Care Act does do a number of things um, in the area of cost containment, and obviously uh, have received less attention than the mandate or the Medicaid expansion. Maybe you could briefly summarize uh, the key elements yeah, thanks, Tom. I was, I was hoping to have a chance to, to follow up on your comment, Rob, because I actually think that um, it's true that the Massachusetts reform took the approach, let's do access first, and then we'll deal with coverage down the road. The Affordable Care Act sort of took that approach, but I think not entirely. I think it would be more accurate to say that in the Affordable Care Act, what you get is a set of policies that we know will increase access, expanding coverage and a set of policies that we hope will reduce spending. So there are a lot of changes to the way 
Medicare contracts with doctors and hospitals that are reflected in the Affordable Care Act. Now, fair enough. What will those do in the long run? Mm -hmm. I don't think we know. And I think one of the difficult things about controlling costs is that what you really want to do, what you really want to do, is not just control costs. You want to drive the system to greater value, right? Because therefore, there are really valuable things mm -hmm. happening. You don't want to cut those costs. You know, not all costs are created equal. And so the question is, how do you identify value? And we don't really know. And the other problem is it's not obvious who the you and how do you identify value. So it's clear for the federal government that the federal government as the payer in the Medicare program, that's the way the federal government gets into this game and to a lesser extent through the Medicaid program. When you get to the state level, you, know, you operate your Medicaid program in conjunction with the federal government, but then the you, you know, that's a piece of the puzzle, but then the other piece is the you who are employers. And then it becomes very decentralized, right? Mm -hmm. And so cost control, or to put it differently, identifying value and paying for value becomes very difficult, right? And if we knew how, if we knew how to do it, we'd already be doing it already. So we had a political problem, not we had a political problem, there, the difficulty in expanding access was a political one but it was clear how to do it. You expand insurance coverage. The policy problem of controlling costs is much more complex. because It is, it is both a technological problem in that we don't really know how to identify value and a political problem in that once we know how to do it, we need to um, cut into people's incomes because that's what healthcare spending is. You know, there, there is, I'm optimistic about this in Michigan actually and I am because we, um, we have had for about six or seven years a, an organization that came out of the Michigan Department of Community Health a number of years ago looking at the uninsured that kind of evolved to the point that we called it the Michigan Health Insurance Access Advisory Council and it is virtually all of the players, uh, the stakeholders in healthcare and it's, so it's labor and business and payers and providers and com consumers and a number of them are sitting here today, Wendy from the Michigan Chamber and Chuck from the Manufacturers Association um, and Margie from Michigan and uh, we've been having a really good conversation about cost containment. And I think actually it's, it's one of those things we agree on. Uh, it's also that contentious table. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things we have, have found a level of agreement on is if, we can, if nobody can afford it, if we don't get under this issue of cost containment. And uh, even I would say that providers, the hospitals and docs and others have stayed at that table talking about cost containment. It is, it is easy to think that's whose ox gets gored when you begin to talk about cost containment. And uh, they've hung in, stayed at this, this conversation. And uh, again, I'm, I'm optimistic that we can have a rational policy conversation in Michigan because we've laid the groundwork for it, you know, to have the players at the table. You know, Dr. Billy, did you? Thanks, uh, Jack Billy from the University of Michigan. I wanted to follow on this excellent theme. One of the few things that both the right and the left agreed on about the Affordable Care Act was that it was primarily oriented towards improving access or coverage and not really uh, much oriented towards uh, redesigning the delivery system. But there are some really superb both uh, pilots and expansions of pilots in there, one of which Michigan is an epicenter for in the United States, which is population management, patient-centered medical home, um, accountable care organizations, organized systems of care. They go by many different names, but um, I was just curious, and especially uh, for uh, Mr. Fowler as well, whether those experiments, since Michigan has so many of them going on, more than I think virtually any other place in the country, uh, because it's not only the federal pilots like the ACOs, but also um, the uh, multi-payer advanced primary care demo and Blue Cross's effort with organized system of care. There's just extensive amount of trying to improve um, effectiveness and coordination. So I was wondering if comments from Massachusetts, whether you've seen that um, of progress from that, and also comments from our Michigan colleagues as to whether that's a source of optimism for you. Well, let me... I'll give you the short answer first, which is yes. And I think uh, you mentioned a couple of them. Uh, another is the Keystone Center at the, at the Michigan Hospital Association doing some cutting edge 
research on how to take cost out of the hospital experience and improve the, the quality of care. Um, and I think we've got a lot to draw on, and those players are all at the table as we, as we talk about it. I'm, I am optimistic that we can, we can have a, um, uh, I'm going to say leading edge, but I think we can lead this whole discussion about cost containment. Um, and we've been seeing things happening in Massachusetts to the insurers for their part have been, um, without the legislature prompting them or government prompting them is to uh, change the provider payment system. So we've been moving away from fee for service to global payments for three or four years now. And almost all of them are heading in that direction. Um, and then, yeah, we've seen the providers reorganize themselves. We have six, I think six federally recognized accountable care organizations now. Um, in Massachusetts, so looking at changing the delivery system. So yeah, all those things are happening, and I, th you know, I think they're all part of the ultimate solution. Um, so yeah, we're encouraged by the signs that we're seeing in Massachusetts as well. Senator Marley, you want to last word? Yes, I, I just have a question. As, as we're trying to work on this containment, and in the Massachusetts plan that you folks had and, and, and introduced, did the individual market purchasers, did they take more ownership in their own health care since you have some history in this thing? In other words, there's a lot of us that feel we just sit on a, you know, a card and you know, it's, it's been there since we've been employed and so now you have an individual. And, and sometimes when they go online and they make these choices, are they, are they choosing higher deductibles so they have skin in the game, as I yeah. call it. Yes. And so could you just elaborate on that? And thank you. Yeah, I think we're seeing a tipping point, both, both with uh, employers getting serious about offering choices, tiered products, uh, less expensive, but then with uh, um, not as many options. Uh, and what's interesting is that, uh, I think surprisingly so, in one sense, because we haven't had this until recently, many, many employees are opting for this, uh, for, for the lower cost, higher deductible, uh, lower premiums, recognizing that if they have a serious illness, they can go to the great institutions, but they don't need to, to do that for a routine checkup. Um, and so I, that, I think, it offers enormous mm -hmm. promise. I think we'd been kind of slow in Massachusetts, maybe they, everybody had, but certainly in Massachusetts, the employer community, I think, had been slow to really, and the insurers, to really push in that direction. But I think with the cost pressures that have been mounting, uh, we've taken significant steps. And as I say, I think we're at a, uh, a tipping point, both from the employer community and the employees. So I'm very heartened about that as a key part of this uh, mosaic of controlling costs over the long term. So it doesn't happen right away, but it takes time. It takes time, but it's moving faster than I would have expected. And, and people I've talked to in the uh, provider community, insurer community, have said the same thing, that it's f happening faster. The, the take-up rate is faster and greater than they expected. Yeah, three years ago, nobody purchased a tiered network product in Massachusetts. Um, and now the health plans tell us their fastest growing products are tiered network products, which to the employer is more affordable, and then to the employee, you know, they have a choice. As Mike said, if you want to go to the expensive institution, you still can, and you might want to, depending on what you're seeking treatment for. But uh, yeah, so the market's responding now. We are just about out of time. And before I turn things over to Marianne, I'll give uh, our two guests from Massachusetts a chance. If you had one piece of advice to give to your college. <laughs> <laughs> Run for the hills. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I couldn't resist. Um, no, I mean, as I think back at, at, um, at, the, at the Massachusetts law and, and what we as an employer community brought to it, I think in the end, because we stayed involved, and it isn't in, in, in a lot of tough negotiations and clashes and so forth. So, uh, for, I mean, it wasn't as if there weren't, uh, we were all singing kumbaya here. Um, but as we stayed involved with the goal of trying to achieve a reform that would 
that would produce universal access, but one that would that would be um, have the incentives in the right place, and that would potentially work long term. Uh, I think our contribution is was one that we, uh, in the end, have a law that is better for employers than a lot of the other options. And two, I think our contribution helped produce a better law than there would have been without our involvement and participation. So uh, I would just pass that on and say I think sticking with it um, and, um, and, and, and trying to stay uh, to the extent possible united, not always easy, as a business community um, is uh, very helpful. I've heard that said that if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Uh, so yeah, I, I agree with Mike. Being at the table was really important. But I would say, because there's a lot of stakeholders in this room, you know, it's important for all of you to work together to make this work. I mean, we, you know, again, again Massachusetts, although we're about the same size as you, seems like it's an awful small community sometimes. And, where we kind of know the leaders of the hospital association, the insurance companies, and the physician groups, and the other players, and you know, have a respect and relationship with them. And even though we don't always agree, I think we've just said to ourselves, all right, six years ago, we got to make access work, and we feel like we did that. I think we're all very serious now about making costs work, because we know if we don't solve this, right. our access isn't going to be sustainable. And, um, so we have to do it, and I, and I feel good that you know, we're all there committed to making this work, and I think that's the only way that we're going to be successful, so that would be the advice I might share. That's great. Thank you all. Before we thank our guests from Massachusetts, I do want to add another special thanks uh, to Regroup, uh, Jan Mullman, and uh, Liz Conlon, who sponsored our webcast today. We really appreciate that. We know we have many people out there watching on the webcast, and that's terrific. And the webcast will live on our website. And so if you want to go back and re uh, replay some of the uh, great quotes that you heard today, you can do that uh, over time. So, uh, and I know there are many more people who want to ask questions today. Uh, our colleagues are going to be with us. We're going to have a reception out here, right outside the auditorium. So also, we know there are a lot of folks in the overflow room. Please come join us at the reception uh, and, and ask your questions there. Please join me in thanking our wonderful panelists.